We're good? We're going to start? All right. Are we live? Bismillah. <coughs> All right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa laha ma ba'd. Welcome to another Next Gen Career Talk. It's our second last one in the series. And inshallah, today we have Dr. Furqan. We're going to be discussing medicine as a career option. Um, we'll get straight into it. Um, I know attendance is a bit low, but that's due to COVID affecting families. But um, I know there are people joining us on Zoom as well. And so if you have any questions, there will be a platform where you can send your questions through, whether you're on Zoom or you're here in person. So we'll get straight into it. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Furqan, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, well, the advertisement, I think, speaks for itself. <laughs> I don't think I have to go too much into it. But just for a recap, um, finished high school in Afaisa College in 2008. Uh, since then, I went to UNSW. And for seven years, I finished a bachelor's of medical science and I finished a doctor's degree. So I finished MD. Uh, finishing the medical degree, uh, went and did my internship residency at Westmead Hospital. And um, after that, went and worked in New Zealand for a year uh, in the, the discipline of orthopedics, which is like bones and joint surgery. When someone has an accident and they break bones, we fix them up or you know, we help them get better. Um, following that, I started um, my PhD in orthopedics, and I've been doing that for the last three years. So, inshallah, I'll be going back to clinical work next year. Hopefully, with the plan of becoming a surgeon one day, maybe in the long distant future. Inshallah. 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 So, that's the summary. Sounds very good. Um, we'll move on to the nitty gritty details now. Sure. <laughs> so, why medicine? What made you choose to study medicine? Uh, <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, when I was in year 12 in Avesa College, um, I was probably uh, pressured into it. And I had my mum saying to me, oh, I'd be a doctor. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to be. I want to be an engineer, either in aeronautics, like aeroplanes, or in chemicals and labora laboratories. Um, but um, at that point, I was thinking about, can I really see myself in a lab, always working as an engineer? Or can I see myself working with aeroplanes all the time? With a bit of force from my, not force, but a bit of persuasion from my mum and a lot of dua, eventually I said, you know what, let's give medicine a crack. So at that time, I couldn't get into medicine, so we went to do medical science. And alhamdulillah, we worked hard, did a lot of du'a, and with the permission of Allah, we got accepted into medicine, and went into medicine from there. Why did I do it? Look, there's a lot of reasons why people want to do it. Uh, but personally, uh, the thing that drove me into it uh, is that it's one of those things that you can do in, as a career, as a job, where not only do you earn as an income to feed your family and, you know, earn a living, but uh, you can also help a lot of people. Let it be helping people locally, you know, in the Sydney, or you can help people overseas. So um, it's one of those uh, those careers where your, your the things that you learn, those skills or the, speci um, the specialty that you learn, you can go anywhere. You'll be an asset to wherever you go, and you can bring khair to both Muslims or even non-Muslims here in Australia and overseas. So um, that was one of the things that drove me to it. Of course, there's a bit more detail to it, but this is in general, that's the thing that really pulled me to it because you can help um, a lot of people. And not only that, when you're working, because you're working and you're helping people, you get a lot of hasanat as well. So that's the thing that got me into it. I see. You've mentioned what, what, what the reasons that led you to choose studying medicine. Yeah. What are some common reasons why people generally, or let's just say for our sake, um, Muslims, why should they be interested in studying medicine? Look, to be honest, I think when it comes to the field of medicine or doctors or, or you know, being a doctor, I think there's not enough of us in the medical field. When I say not enough of us, there's plenty of GPs out there, no disrespect to the people. Um, all my GP colleagues out there, you know, are doing an awesome job. Um, but we don't have a lot of Muslims out there who are very specialized in medicine and are actually at the forefront of science and medicine. Um, so to help uh, and to expand the skill set of our community, both locally and internationally, I think we have Muslims go into it in the, with the intention of being the best they can be and what, whatever they want to do, or be the best they can be in medicine or any other career, both um, helping us you know, develop further mm. now in our current situation and in the future. But mm. other reasons why people get in is you know, they can earn a lot of money, or the people say, you know, get a respect, you, know, you go places and people are like, oh, he's a doctor, oh, mashallah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of sacrifice that comes with it, a lot of struggle you need to do. Um, but, you know, people see the end goal, but not mm. all the challenges and the struggles that, that's behind it. So, mm. And I think when you choose a, a reason like that, that um, 
uh, temporary or it's it's not it, it won't get you through actual struggle in my opinion <sighs> like, it, I knew, I knew what you're saying. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of things like you can become a lawyer, you can be an engineer, and you can be the best and work hard, long hours. Mm. And you know, you can um, you can find that even though you're working so hard and you're putting so much effort into it, if you don't have a proper intention, whichever discipline you do, other medicine, mm. or other, if you don't have the proper near behind it, you you won't be feel satisfied. Yeah, exactly. Right. Otherwise, you'll be wasting your time, mm. not in so much in the dunya perspective, but for the when you're coming to praying for your akhirah, you're wasting your time, yeah. because you're putting so much emphasis and drive into something that's going to help you little benefit. If if anything, will actually go against you in the hereafter. So with the thing with medicine, you know, you for example, in a day of working as a doctor, let's say I'll give you an example. Right, someone is sick on the ward and you want to help them, and the little, little thing as me going onto a medication chart and writing antibiotic for this person, every time that person gets an antibiotic, inshallah, we get the hasanat for it. Mm. You know, inshallah, when they get better, Allah reward us for our hard work and also the fact that we're able to utilize the asbab for them to get better. And inshallah, those people, there have been uh, Muslims who we help out or non Muslims as well, if they make dua for us, inshallah, Allah will accept their duas as well from the sick. So. Mm. Yeah. It's a very interesting perspective. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's you got to take it from a um, uh, from a holistic point of view. If you look at form strictly from a you know earning money point yeah. of view and a career point of view, you can do anything. Mm. Uh, you can even earn more money as a businessman, right? Mm. Or you can have more status as an engineer or working in the in council or you know in uh, politics. Mm. But um, I think it's only one of those professions where you can become so specialized in one thing by also helping people on the ground. Mm. You know those two don't come much frequent in uh, in, um, in, commu in, sp in, c in careers. Mm. The only other thing I can think of is maybe teaching. You know, you become so well good at it and your direct benefit is helping kids who are coming through high schools and becoming mm. you know, our next generation. So, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, so, now some more specific questions about how to get into medicine. Sure. So, what are the pathways? Let's just say we've got high school students here. Yeah, there's a few. What are the pathways to get into medicine? Yeah, so yeah. or in New South Wales, yeah. <laughs> we'll see <you> somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Defines how far you want to yeah. go, right? Yeah. Um, look, when it comes to getting into medicine in Australia or in New South Wales, um, there's there's usually the most orthodox or the most common way of getting is two ways: either going straight after high school, finishing your talk, or finishing a university degree, and then getting into medicine. Uh, if you're going to do it straight after high school, which I couldn't do, I didn't get the marks that were good enough for it. Um, you fin you do your year 12, you do sit for your ATAR, you probably aim for ATAR 98 plus, you got to get really good high marks. You got to sit the UMAT, which is the exam UCAT that... UCAT now. UCAT, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, it's called UCAT now. So you got to sit the UCAT, which tests your general skills and your comprehension and analytic analytical skills. Yep. Uh, and then once you've got two good marks in them, they will offer you maybe an interview for the university. And the interview is trying to see whether or not what type of person you are. So whether you can talk to people, whether you can understand the, the situation, because you don't want a person who's a brilliant mind, but can't communicate with people. You know, imagine a doctor you go see who's very smart, but he doesn't know how to speak to you. Right, it's, you can't do that. This won't work, right? Because, mm. um, so then they do interviews. Uh, the different universities have different interview st uh, styles. So once they look at the three scores, they'll select the top 200 or 300 applicants and accept them into medicine. The second way of getting in is a thing called postgraduate. So you do a university degree. can be whatever you want to do, arts, science, engineering, whatever you want. You do an exam called the GAMSAT, which is an exam that's focusing on science, like chemistry, biology, and some other things as well, comprehension and other stuff. And same thing, you do an interview. So they look at these three, your average mark in your uni, average mark in the GAMSAT, and your interview score. And then if you're good in them, then they'll accept you. There's a lot more details, you know, if the, if the Shabab wanted to talk about the details of how to do exactly, especially the ones who are year 10 plus. Mm. Um, but that's the overall, either postgraduate or undergraduate. So regardless, just to summarize for everyone. Yeah. You have to do well in school. Very good. Or uni. You have to top your class, number one. <laughs> so you know your, your classes now in high school, you have to be number one. Or number two. Or <laughs> number three. I was number two. <laughs> and Alhamdulillah, still got there. Alhamdulillah. But um, yeah. yeah, so you got to go through. Yes, you yes, got to Academics. Good. Yes. Then you've got the UCAT or GAMSA, so the yes. med entry exams. Yes. And then you have your interview. Yes. Okay. So the things that you can do at your stage uh, is getting um, going really well in your, in your schooling. So, you know, when you're English, your mathematics, your science subjects in high school, you've got to smash them, like get A's or 90 mm. plus. Um, if you can't, uh, so one, if you sort that out, 
things like when it comes to seeing the UMAT or sitting, uh, getting ready for the interviews, there is uh, resources out there in the Muslim community that we can put you forward to uh, that can help you prepare for them. And I'm sure you know and I know as well as we can help out. Sorry to digress a bit, sure. but let's say you said we need to do well academically, right? Yes. But what if I don't like the subjects I do at school? So I might not, let's just say I do like one or two subjects, mm. but I hate English, I hate... Uh, <laughs> I hate <it> English. <laughs> <laughs> I hate chemistry, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hate business, yeah. whatever. Yeah. There aren't, it, it's very rare that you find a student likes every single subject Correct. that they choose. So how do we overcome that barrier and still do well despite not liking the subjects we choose? Or we get offered, basically? That's a hard question, man. Mm. Um, because... You know, there's only a certain amount of subjects that your school offers, and especially yeah. when I went to high school as well, they said these are your subjects that you can do, or these are, off these are the limit that you can do, yeah. right? Um, you try your best to do as best as you can in a subject, especially when I did my English in year 11, year 12, I was horrible, I was really bad. And you can mm. probably tell the way I talk, I probably don't talk like a doctor. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, my, so going through, um, you got to focus on those subjects that you're not good at and try to... <coughs> you know, do well in them. And the only way you can actually improve in those is if you work hard at it. Um, there's, no, there's no easy way around it. It's literally just doing hard work mm. and doing a lot of du'a. Um, if you can't, if it comes to a situation where there's, let's say, let's say you've got five subjects you're doing for year 12 and three of them are really bad and you don't like them at all and your marks are not good mm. enough, I guess your second avenue will be trying to do postgraduate. So you choose a university degree you're really good at, you absolutely smash that degree and then you just sit for the game set, get good marks in that and then apply. Mm. Yeah, so it just bottom depends. Line is bottom line work. is you got to do hard work. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, there's the um, uh, as I said to you, Labib, in your early days, or well, the blessing is in the struggle. Mm. So you will not get anything in life, let it be in medicine or anything, unless you struggle for it. Mm. Nothing comes to you in a silver plate. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, if you look at the history of the Muslims, even from the Prophet until mm. until now, always our our blessings and our victories always came from struggles. So mm. you can never get really good in wherever you want to without hard work. Mm. So get ready. <laughs> There's a, actually an interesting quote I came across by um, Imam, Imam Ahmed, one of his teachers. He oh said, no. um, all the intelligent people in the world have ijma consensus yep. that comfort and blessing is not achieved through comfort and blessing. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. So like, you have to work hard to get some sort of comfort and blessing. Like, this Correct. is an agreed upon principle of life. Yes. Like, to think I'm going to get into med school or whatever it is, whether it's you know, business, yeah. engineering, Anything we've off, like talked about in these career talks, to think you'll get somewhere with them without effort is like, it's silly basically. Yeah, it's just like yeah. for even like even a simple analogy. You want to eat a nice food in your kitchen, right? Does the food come to you? No, you got to prepare the food yourself, right? The more effort you put into the food you're preparing, which I like my food, the more effort you put <laughs> you prepare, you, you, the more effort you put into the the meal that you're preparing, the nicer mm. the food will be. So same with the HSC. And I remember my mum would say this to me: the HSC or year 12 or year 11 is like a that opportunity is like a golden key. The more effort in, you put into it, the better your key will become. Mm. And the more effort you put in, the more doors you can open. So you've got one shot, and you don't wreck it. Um, you know, I know your age, you want to play your your Fortnite or, you know, get interrupted by TikTok, right? But, you know, if you, um, if you try to focus, don't get me wrong, I was playing a lot of Xbox in year 12 as well, don't get me wrong. But, um, you know, you study hard and then you play a little bit. You know, you got to balance it. Definitely. Um, so let's move on to sort of the timeline. So we talked about high school, yes. and what someone would need to do in high school. Yeah. What is a, so let's talk about the medicine degree itself. What's yeah. the workload like? <laughs> Um, so it's, I can't give a full proper realistic view because I entered medicine from halfway. Mm. Uh, with, I did um, phase two and phase three year in SW, which means I come from halfway on. The workload, it's, it's, it's pretty intense in the sense that you're in the hospitals quite a lot, learning f in, in the hospital system. Um, how much hours? Probably maybe 30 hours a week. You're probably dedicating to being in hospital or studying. Mm. Um, whether or not you want to do something on the side like a job is completely up to you. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, I want to say it's super intense. Uh, I think I'm more busy now than I was mm. back in med school. But, um, you know, you only know how hard something is now when you look back and you're like, that was nothing. Mm. You know, so it's not too bad. Um, it's, it's doable. And if, you know, if you're surviving year 11, year 12, I think you'll survive med school. Mm. Um, you just got to put the same intensity throughout. Mm. You don't drop it. Yeah. yeah. So I, remember I asked you when I got in. Yeah. I said, how much do work do I need to put in? You said, as much work as if you're going to sit the HSC next week. Exactly. 
exactly. every week for yeah. five years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did it work? Yeah, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd say I agree with you. Like, a uni degree actually requires you to a full time load, no matter what degree, requires you to do 40 hours. That's right. So it's now these have you have 10 credit points per subject, means 10 hours per subject, including class time. Mm -hmm. So I reckon if you actually put 40 hours towards any degree, even the difficult ones like medicine, law, you'll actually do well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but we put, like, I know, <laughs> I've seen people put 40 hours in the whole semester, <laughs> instead of per week. Yeah. So like, it's like a full-time job, basically. It is, it yeah. is, right. And th as I said, you know, you can get into med school and just pass or get into med school and come out like a rock star, right? Mm. Like you're really smart and really know your medicine or your, your profession. But um, but as you said, the more you put into it, uh, and if you just work the standard forty hours, you will come out, and, you know, surviving the mm. degree. You know, those exams are daunting in the sense that if I don't pass this year, I got to repeat the year. But you mm. know, but if you just get the foundations right and you just put the work that they ask you to put, you'll pass. Mm. Nothing extra, not like something that's like Einstein level. Yeah. And just if we only, as I said to I said to Labib, if I can pass, you'll pass. You'll be fine. <laughs> I think one thing to note is that. Um, I'd say the, the minimum level of F work is higher than other degrees mm. because I've seen people with like in high school, 98, 99 ATAS fail medicine exams. Oh, really? And that, that's purely because of lack of effort. Yes, They're right. very intelligent people, but just lack of effort. So imagine they can get 98, 99 ATAR in school yep. and they fail the medicine exam. Yep. It's just lack of effort. So like there has, like you can't really cram no. the week be night before for medicine. Like no. you could cram the month before. No. So, for example, no, not, not I, before, I was yeah. I was preparing for an exam for the College of Surgeons called um, the GSSC, yeah, yeah. and they advise us to start st studying for the exam six months ahead. Mm. You know, an hour a day on the yeah. weekends, four hours, right? Yeah. So you got to do a six months of study for this one exam that goes over two days. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's something in medicine, something you got to do continuously and build it up mm. because you can't cram; it's too too much. The human body is too complicated. Yeah, because you learn about the human body and how it works, and then you got to learn about diseases. Mm. You know, and then a structure, which is completely, mm. it's a very in-depth, subhanAllah, you know, yeah. so, um, but yeah, it's, it's doable, uh, but as you said, um, you know, other degrees uh, may, you know, may be able to do things off campus or can do things offline or on, you know, on Zoom or, you know, learning from a distance, but with medicine, you've got to learn the theory and then put it into practice, so you have to complement what you learn in your textbooks with seeing patients, mm. you've got to put two and two together, which is not something you can do a lot with other degrees. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So after completing a medi medical degree, yep. what's next? So after finishing the medical degree, you do a thing called your internship. You probably hear this in the medical shows. People do internship. You know, everyone's getting smashed. They're so stressed out. They're vomiting everywhere, mm. right? But your internship in Australia, more or less, is the first year after medical school where you have a lot of supervision. Mm. So you do go into hospitals and you work in different rotations. You do a rotation in emergency department. You do one in surgery, one in medicine. Uh, one in relief where when everyone goes home and rests in the afternoon or in the weekends there's doctors who look after the hospital so there's the relief doctors um, you do a rotation of that um, and then you do one more either medical medicine or surgery yeah. so during that time you I remember working at least 50 60 hours a week during that time uh, not on the best pay to be honest like I know people who graduate from dentistry on a much more higher salary mm. But, you know, as an intern finishing and you're working 50, 60 hours a week, you know, the standard working week is 40 hours, right? So as an intern, you're working 50 to 60, which is a lot more than what other people do. Um, and you work hard, you wake up early, finish late, mm. uh, or you f start early and finish late in the evening when you're doing the afternoon on call. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's survivable. Um, it depends which hospital you go to as well. Some hospitals are more busy, some hospitals are quiet. So life as an intern, yeah, it's, there's, it's a spectrum. Mm. <laughs> Let's put it as simple as that. It can be okay, mm. or it can be quite um, intense. Mm. And you know, I personally went to Westmead, and at that time, it was considered one of the challenging hospitals. Um, Hamza, we survived. We didn't. We didn't Hamza. sink. We swam. Hamza. Mm. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Hamza. Um, it, but you, when you're working on the on the wards, like when we did medicine or surgery, you have you come across really interesting things. Um, it's only the first time you really know, you really appreciate the fact that you're doing something, you're helping actually other people. Mm. Um, yeah, there's interesting stories I, w I went through in uh, in, in the hospitals. Mm. Yeah. Um, some of the the attendees might be asking, yeah, what's the salary like as an intern and, and <laughs> on <onward?" laughs> Uh, so I haven't looked at the New South Wales Health um, 
or even other ho yeah. uh, other other states um, award rates for interns and residents. But when in my days, finishing internship, I think my salary was sixty eight thousand base, mm. which is nothing, right? To be honest, after finishing seven years of uni, you come here with a medical science and a medicine degree compared to what people get. People will get that as in other degrees after mm. finishing three years, right? Um, but Hamda, it does climb. Um, as in residency goes up and in reg SRMO it climbs up, unaccredited reg it climbs up, accredited reg drag climbs up and then you know, once you hit uh, seven or eight years after finishing a uni that's where it caps around maybe, I can't remember the top of my head, but it usually goes from 68,000 resident year which is a year after internship probably goes up to 78,000 roughly. Yeah. But you know, if you work more than what you're rostered for, you can always claim overtime. So you mm. just pull forward your overtime sheets and they mm. will pay you for doing extra work that you're not rostered to. Mm. That, you know, some people don't do overtime, some people do do overtime. So I can't tell you exactly how much you'll get. Mm. But roughly, the base salary for interns is like 68,000. Mm. And consultant level? Like, sorry, specialist level? <laughs> it depends on the specialty, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You can... Uh, we'll touch on that later then. Yeah, we'll yeah. go on that later. Yeah. So... <laughs> So you got internship and residency, which is the second year after graduating. Yes. Then what happens next? Yeah, so after you finish, finish residency is where you usually decide which way you want to go with medicine. So people, as you see, you know, work when you go see a GP in the, uh, in, the, in the community, those people do a training program for GPs, and that is a specialization by itself. Uh, some people do GPs, some people want to do medical specialty, some want to do surgeons. Want to be a surgeon, some want to be obstetrician and gynecologist, people who specialize in babies and women's health. Um, some people want to do psychiatry. So mm. each of these disciplines have their own um, training programs and durations. Um, how, which one you want to pick is up to the person. Each of them is dif uh, different duration, different intensity. Um, but yeah, it's really up to the person what they want to do. Mm. Uh, I, I thought of different specialties myself. Uh, thought about thought about emergency, but I said, you know, I can't see myself working night shifts for ever because uh, they do night shifts as well. Yep. Um, I thought about doing medicine and like as a medical specialties like gastroenterology, cardiology, and I said to my, you know, couldn't, you know, medicine's not my strong point. I'd rather see things and fix things that I can see right. Like, mm. um, so I didn't glue with that as well. Uh, psychiatry, which is about mental health, you know, those are, it's interesting for me, but I, I couldn't see myself doing it for a long term. Mm. But, um, but yeah, the thing that drew me is surgery. Because uh, whenever I saw the problem or whenever we're doing operations, you can see what's in front of you. Mm. And then whenever you do something, you and surgery is finished and the person sees the benefit straight away, usually, you know. So, um, or they sue you. Or, 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 or they sue you, yeah. Now the suing rate is low, yeah, like yeah, it's not too high. Yeah. The only time you get sued is like, like if it's negligence, like mm. if you've actually stuffed up and it's your fault. Yeah. You know, it's not common practice mm. to stuff up in there, yeah. So, um, generally speaking, so you said there's medical, yes. surgical, and there's like GP, yes. um, psychiatry, yes. Ob obstetrics, gynecology, gynecology and pediatrics, yep. like children. So yes, you pediatrics. say broadly speaking. Broadly. There's more. Yeah, there's yeah. more. Yeah, but broadly speaking, yeah. these are like the common ones. Yes. And ha so let's start with medical. How long would it take for someone to finish their specialization, roughly speaking? Okay, so mm -hmm. the usually after the residency, so you did internship or residency. So that's something you do for every specialization. So doing a medical specialty, you do two years usually of BPT training, which is basic physician training. Uh, so you do two years of that, so that's four now. And then usually you apply for a subspecialty medical specialization. So it's either gastro, like you know, intestines, cardio, which is your heart, respiratory, which is your lungs, you know, all these things. You pick which specialty you want to do. Yep. So that usually lasts for three years. So let's add three to that, that's seven. And then usually people do a fellowship for like one or two years. I'm not, I think usually in, in medicine. So that can, let's say they do one year. So eight years after medical school until you become a consultant. And that's in the best case scenario. Yeah. That's not considering that you may be delayed. Uh, there's all issues of um, recruitment or employment or yeah. there's uh, issues of COVID, mm. right? So those things can delay things. Um, but yeah, so usually around eight years mm. from internship to finishing a specialization, usually mm. roughly is when you become a specialist in, medi in mm. the medical field. Yeah. So you get paid throughout those years? Of course. Years. Yeah, so you're studying. Like, well, they might think that. No. Because like so if you do a master's or PhD, like yeah. I'm talking about other fields, yeah. even even medical. Like you don't, it's your student, basic, unless yeah. you get a scholarship. That's correct. Um, so in medicine, it's a bit different in the sense that even you're, though you're training, it's still you're employed. So that yeah. training that I'm talking about is you're working full time, 
mm. and they're teaching you medicine at the same time. So yeah. you're learning on the job. It's like imagine being a very smart sp apprenticeship for eight years, mm. right? Now, even when you do a full-time master's or PhD, that's when you're a proper student. You're not, mm. earn, you're not doing that. Yeah, that's, you're I taking think. time out, like what I'm doing. Okay. Um, but when you actually, to go from internship to full consultant level uh, medicine is roughly eight years. Eight years. And yeah. what about surgical? Oh, I know it's, there's a lot of different <laughs> branches, but so roughly I'll speaking. I'll talk it from the orth orthopedic, orthopedic yeah. point of view, yeah. okay? So from orthopedic point of view, do, do internship and residency. Uh, usually people do an SRMO in orthopedics, not everyone, but usually that gets done, so that's another one, three years. Um, unaccredited registrar, sometimes one, sometimes two years. Mm. Some people do three, some people do four, this depends yeah. right how long you take. Yeah. Usually it's two more years, right? That's five. The actual surgical training program itself to become a surgeon is five years, mm. right? So that's 10 years, Okay. right? And then you do one or two years of fellowship, which is a subspecialization in orthopedics, can be one or two years. Yep. So let's say 11 years. Okay. So it'll take you roughly 11 years in the best case scenario to finish from med school to becoming an independent surgeon. Mm. I yeah. see. Um, before, just I had one more question about surgery. Before that, so in medical specialties, what's the pay like when you become a specialist? Roughly. Uh, look, it's hard to put a, put a number on it because for medicine, I, I don't know what it comes when it, for medical specialists, but mm. for surgeons, uh, it can vary, man. It can. It, it'll definitely be six figures. Um, but you know whether or not how much public work you do, how much private work you do in a private hospital, how much public work you do in the public hospitals, how busy you are, mm. um, you know they can vary. Mm. But you know, you'll be comfortable. Mm. You'll be comfortable. I can I can tell you comfortable. You know? Once you get there, once you're in medicine, we're going to talk numbers. But for now, from your guys' point of view, you'll be comfortable. Trust me, you'll be earning more than the average person. <laughs> mm. um, okay, so we talked about specialization options. So what's the usual lifestyle or routine of a doctor? So you mentioned internship, the hours. Yes. Um, residency, I'm assuming, will be similar. Yes. What about in the specialization? So, oh, sorry, before that, actually. So we talk about medical, surgical. GP is... Yeah, so GP, the internship residency. Yeah. And then if you go into the GP training program, my friends will probably shoot me for this if I get it wrong. So I think it's three years. That's two. Two, see? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's two years. Yeah. So you two, it depends what you're doing in residency, right? If you, yeah, do the if, you res if you include your residency. Yeah, if you include your residency and do like ED yeah. terms and pediatric terms, you do yeah. two more years as a GP yeah. and then you're done. So after four or five years, you can be done and finished as a GP yeah. from medical school. Mm. Yeah. Um, but in saying that, Yanni, a GP, you finished, like just to give an insight to the Shabab here, Yanni, you finished, but Yanni, you, you, can, you see everything, right? Mm. You see everything from the top to bottom. Mm. And in orthopedics, at least I can focus on bones and joints, right? Mm. But you guys have to understand everything. Mm. So when someone says to me, I have something wrong with my bladder or, you know, or something with my heart, I say, look, man, I'm a carpenter. Mm. I don't deal with your heart. If you want to see that, you might have to see a GP or, you know, see someone else. Yeah. But, you know, a GP has to understand all, all systems on the human body. Yeah. Mm. Which is, uh, for me, it was uncomfortable. <laughs> mm. What about, so we'll go through a couple more. So yeah. maybe ED and PEDS. So ED... I emergency. Think emergency, yeah. uh, I think it's similar to the BPT style. So you do internship residency SRMO, which is Senior Resident Medical Officer. Yep. Um, I think when you get on the program, I think it'll be three or four years, if I'm not wrong. Mm. Roughly For around the whole there. program? I think so. I think it's five. Maybe mm, five. Yeah. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. I haven't looked into it. Uh, maybe five years. So maybe eight, eight years. Eight. Yeah, roughly and eight years. Think similar. Yeah. I think it's, it'll be similar six. to the medicines, like yeah. BPT, AT yeah. level. Yeah. Stuff. So usually it'll take... So GP is like you say, four or five years? Yes. Medical related, eight, years. eight surgical, 10 plus, 10, 10 plus. 11, 12, yeah, yeah. to finish. Okay. I think uh, from my point of view, for me, it'll probably be 13 years when I've finished. Mm. Um, but some people finish in 10 years, some finish in nine, some finish in 11, so it varies. It varies. But because I took time out to do a PhD, yep. uh, which yep. means I'm gonna research degree on top of a medical degree. Mm. Um, that's why it took longer, yeah. I see. And what the, so now going to the lifestyle routine question. Yeah. I know it varies from specialty to specialty, but yeah. generally speaking, like what's the typical day of a, of a doctor in a training program? <laughs> Intense. Yeah. So I talk from a uh, surgical point of view, from mm. orthopedics. Um, this is probably the most it? intense. Yeah, which is one, yeah, even yeah. like I want to more one of the orthopedics, yeah. you've got general surgery. Yeah. Neurosurgery is actually more intense than yeah. orthopedics. Um, neurosurgery is a surgery of the brain and the spinal cord, right? Mm. Um, so they're, they're full out busy. Um, for the, from us, from our point of view, you're probably working maybe 60 plus hours a week. So when it, let me put in context for you, 60 hours a week, you're waking up at 6.30 in the morning, 
or six o'clock in the morning and you're working till six, seven o'clock at night for five days. And top of that, sometimes or you work on Friday night, Saturday and Sunday and come back to work on Monday for another five days. Right? Mm. And this, this on call that you do on the weekend happens sometimes one in four or one in five. One in four, one in four weekends, or every fourth weekend or every fifth weekend, right? Mm. Um, you also do afternoons to the next day. So you do Monday, uh, let's say you finish at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., you'll be on call overnight to the next morning. And when you do on call of anything that comes to the hospital for orthopedics or surgical admissions, or they'll give you a call and you'll have to see them in ED or take them to surgery. Mm. Um, so it roughly comes out to averaging 60 to 70 hours per week you're working in this. So what some people do in, in one week is 40 hours. As surgical people, you do 60 plus. So you do one and a half weeks work, one and a half weeks worth of work in one week. Right, mm. so when people have like they finish at five o'clock, they clock off and go home. You don't do that. You go, you're still on the phone, or you're in operations operating on people, mm. or when you finish operating, you got to go down to emergency and see patients who are waiting for you, broken legs, broken mm. arms, mm. Um, or kids who need help, you know, because they hurt themselves, right? Um, or like even for I remember when I was working in neurosurgical HDU in Westmead, my neuro my neurosurgical registrars, I kid you not, they'll be working all day. I'll be doing the night shift on the, their HDU ward, high dependency unit, and I'll still see them through the night, seeing patients in ED and getting phone calls. Mm. I'm like, I thought to myself, then these guys sleep. Mm. Uh, you know, they're still working and they're absolute machines. Mm. I don't know how to do it, you know. But um, it's tough. I couldn't do that. I saw that. I'm like, nah, it's too much. But um, you know, orthopedics is tough. G with general surgery, which is a surgery of the tummy, anything from here down, uh, those people. Uh, they're pretty intense as well because they look after traumas and general like gallbladders, stomach, bowels, mm. intestines. If someone has an accident, someone has a stabbing, they go to them, for example. Mm. Um, you know, those people are working, sometimes they do night shifts as well, called the ASU, uh, Acute Surgical Unit. Yeah. So they do seven night shifts back to back. Mm. So in a nutshell, it's intense. Um, but you know the you know it's not forever. When you become a consultant, it becomes not in as intense. Oh, so there is hope. Yeah, there is hope. Yeah. yeah. So you do this for like what eight years or ten years, and mm. once you become a consultant, you have registrars working for you. So what I am doing now, when I become a consultant, I have my equivalent in ten years later working for me. Mm. So yeah. all, the, all the lifestyle be of a, of a specialist. I think mean, it varies how much they work. Yeah. So on average, as, uh, on average. So for example, some surgeons will probably go into their private rooms and you know see patients maybe two days a week where they'll see people come to them from GPs. You say, imagine, for example, let BB say to me, for kind of have this patient who's been having, you know, this type of hip pain for like seven years and it's not going away. Can you have a look at him? And let people send them to me and they'll come to me. So that's consulting, mm -hmm. right? And you'll be doing that, let's say two days a week. You might be operating maybe two days a week <coughs> as well. And then some people take the fifth day off. So mm -hmm. some people work six days. It depends how much you want. So you control mm -hmm. your lifestyle and how much you want to work. But it's, it's you could say the hours are on your terms. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to work two days a week, you can. No, if you want to work four days a week, you can. Do you want to work six days a week, you can. It's yeah. up to you. I see. Because I know some surgeons who work six days a week. It's crazy. Mm. But you know, it's up to you how much you want to do. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's yeah. up to you. Uh, up to coming up to a consultant or a specialist, it's it's more it's it's uh, it's like uh, very hard work. Yeah. But once you become a consultant, you control your hours. When I say you control your hours, you control your workload and how much yeah. you want to work. Mm. Yeah. I see. Um, let's move on to a, sort of a, a, a new subtopic, which is medicine and Islam. Yes. So are there any challenges you have faced as a Muslim in the profession? <laughs> uh, where do I start? <laughs> um, look, getting into medicine, I don't think it was a problem. I think they, well, I personally don't think they yeah. judged me from how I was. Mm. Um, I, I went to the interview. I think my interviewees liked me and they accepted me into the program mm. with my marks, of course. Yeah. I had the marks yeah. to support it. Um, you know, during in medicine, you know, there'll be situations where, um, you know, you'll come across patients or doctors who are, you know, don't get along with Muslims for whatever reason. Mm. Um, I remember back in 2014 in medical school, I had comments thrown at me saying I look like a terrorist because I had a full proper beard and long hair during those days, mm. right? Um, you know, but those type of comments, just like how the sisters get comments on the street about, you know, the hijabs or niqabs, right? You just take it on the chin and move mm. on. And it's part of the, the sunnah of the Muslim or the sunnah of the Prophet to, you know, be insulted and ridiculed. And mm. it's not nothing new. And we shouldn't be snowflakes. Mm. You know what I'm trying to say? That's my opinion. <laughs> I haven't heard that word in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't be a snowflake. Mm. You know, you're a Muslim. Have, have, you have some honor, you know. 
you know, mm. they don't know what they, they're coming from the outside. Mm. You know, we have the Dean of Islam to be hold on to tight to. Um, so, you know, so having the experiences in medicine, I think you can achieve what you want to achieve. Of course, there'll be some people who will be racist like in any other specialty or any other career, yeah. any other profession. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it wasn't too bad. Um, I remember when I was working in New Zealand, I had some interesting comments. I remember my patient didn't want to interact with me because I was a Muslim, which was weird. This is before the Christchurch attacks. Mm. Um, I had another patient who thought I was a priest, which was weird. They go, oh, Father. I'm like, I am, I'm not your priest. <laughs> I'm a Muslim. Mm. <laughs> and I'm not a, a scholarly person. But anyway, <laughs> mm. but um, that, was, that was a joke. But it actually did happen. Um, yeah. But uh, so generally speaking, I'm not sure, you know, the sisters in medicine may say other things with the you know, sisters who wear hijabs. Um, but from a, from a brother who was in medicine, who had a beard, at the, you know, through medical school, um, it wasn't too bad. It was, mm. it was, it was bearable. I think it, it, there's been a shift though, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think it depends on which hospitals you, you're at as exactly. well. Exactly. And I think yeah. um, the, 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 the weird inter encounters <laughs> I had... I think it was more in the eastern hospitals. Yeah. And I think when I was in the western hospitals, it was okay. Yeah, because if, if, like, if you look at Campbelltown, Liverpool hospitals, yeah. or even Bankstown, most of the doctors are Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like... Not just Muslims, out, most of the patients are Muslims. Yeah. Right? You've so got a problem with us, you've got to discharge half of your hospital, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, like so personally, I haven't, I haven't encountered any trouble, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, as a medical student in hospital. In the medical degree, there are some... Uh, you could say troublesome uh, educational things, but I think that's that could probably be present in other degrees as well. For example, like um, LGBTQ and all that. Like oh, that was around in my time, bro. Yeah, so it's probably the change here. Yeah. See, yeah. change. I I finished med school in 2015, and you finished 2021. Six yeah. years, boys. Six years. Yeah. The paradigm shifted. Yeah. Well, that's fine. That's bad. Good luck, bro. Um, I'm through this. <laughs> <laughs> I guess but I guess there's, there's yeah. a more of that type of awakening or that yeah. type of idea or this yeah, thinking yeah. that's happening. That's so getting pushed a yeah, lot they're getting now, pushed yeah. through the medical yeah. degree. Yeah, and at the end of the day, the person in front of you is a human being. Mm. Like I'm gonna treat them either way. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. As exactly. Muslims, we understand yeah. what discrimination is and what being sidelined is. So mm. why the hell would I do it to someone in front of me? Yeah, definitely. Like, like, you know, maybe not everyone's on that page, mm. but um, but you know, I think from our point of view, we should be alright. Yeah. Inshallah. I'd say even the number of Muslims getting into med schools yep. is way more now. Yeah. Um, like I look at Western Sydney, for example, the last two years there's been at least 10 out of 120 That's awesome. that are Muslims. That's awesome. Whereas in my year, maybe like five. So I think um, in my year, when I was in UNSW, there's, the cohort has around 300 students. Yeah. And then I'll probably say there was maybe five of us mm. or six of us. Yeah, out of 300. Out of 300. Yeah. That I know of. Mm. I don't know if there was sleeper cells here and there, like <laughs> the people who are Muslims were not declaring it. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But from the ones I knew, uh, I knew around five mm. or six. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I think for the Shabab here, like, I don't think there's a better opportunity than now to get in. Like, they, they really want to, especially Western Sydney, they want to yeah. push that multicultural diversity yeah. That's um, good sort for of us. idea. That's yeah. good for us, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> like, but there's no excuse really. Like, they're not going to be racist towards you. Like, you're part, <laughs> 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 You're part of their brand. You're part of the the advertising. Yeah. But Yanni, I think at the end of the day, if you put your hard work into yeah, it, yeah, definitely. No matter what your background is, you'll be accepted. Yeah. Um, and I, I can say that for an example from a personal friend of mine, um, who's for me is quite inspirational. He's a doctor. Um, if you look at him from the outside, he's like you can t you can tell he's a Muslim. Mm. But he's uh, quite academically quite switched on and so good as a doctor, the other surgeons respect him now. Mm. And he's not even a surgeon yet. Mm. And that's because he's that far ahead. So he's yeah. excelled that far that even people who are actually operating look to him and say, wow. Yeah. And I've seen that myself, alhamdulillah. I, had the, I was in colorectal surgery in Liverpool. Yes. And there was a, a multi-specialty meeting and Dr. Aflah was there. Yeah. And he's a cancer specialist. That's right. And you can see the aura he has in the room, the respect yes. everyone has. Yes. Um, even though his bee is like this big, <laughs> mashallah. <laughs> mashallah. Um, no one said anything. And yeah. whatever he says, everyone goes quiet and they listen. Yeah, and yeah. They take his opinion very seriously. Definitely. Even the surgeons. Surgeons usually <laughs> get <laughs> <up> to listen <laughs> yeah. to the other specialties. But subhanAllah, like, I saw that. I was like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Like he practices deen fully. Yes. Huge beard. Yeah, yeah. Everything. And he's also a, a, um, a teacher for the uni. 
like yes. a lecturer for the uni. For well. WSU, yeah, yeah. mashallah. So the thing I had with, uh, I remember in medical school, talking about beards, right? Mm. So I was in the uh, first year of medicine and I was going into Liverpool Hospital. I walk into the orthopedic theatre and doing operations, right? And literally I walk first step into the theatre and they said to me, stop. Mm. I said, khair inshallah, what's happening? They said, your beard's out. And mm. because you're doing operations in orthopedics, you need to be very, very clean. They said, your beard's out, we can't get you too close. Mm. So I had to stay in the corner of the room. So imagine a room this big, right? And I had to be on the edges, on the yeah. side skirts, because they don't want my beard hair falling into the patient's wound. Mm. And from that day onwards, I'm like, how am I going to do this? And now, alhamdulillah, now, as uh, you probably read in my bio, I help surgeons operate in general. Sometimes it's a general, but mainly in orthopedics. So now on, after from that experience, I've learned how to cover my beard fully and cover my hair fully. So the only thing you see is my eyes, mm. you know, like a ninja, <laughs> literally. And then we're going to, we're going to so surgeries um, and everything's covered. So usually when I, walk in, when I go work for a new surgeon, they see my appearance. They're, I can tell they're a bit nervous because mm. I'm going to help them do a joint replacement surgery and they're a bit nervous. Like, this is what this guy's got a big beard, like, how he's going to operate with yeah. me. Yeah. And then once I put everything on, they're like, wow, you do a really good job with your beard. I said, thank you very much. Mm. So that in itself is da'wah, yeah, yeah. You, know? you know. So you can still hold on to our principles and our beliefs in Islam mm. and still practice. Um, with the minus exception of COVID, um, that can yeah. that's challenging with the masks and all that. So that's yeah. a different topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so next question was: Can someone hold on to their dean during med school? Definitely. So we're talking about as a doctor. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Mm. So there is a there is a in med school there is a lot of uh, different um, 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 how should I say cultures that are not Islamically appropriate that are be you know socializing or you know going out and drinking and all this other stuff. Mm. But, um, you know, you might feel pressured to hang out with them. Mm. But I think if you have some, one or two Muslims who are with you and you guys, are, you people are strong, you won't, you won't fall. You can still be mm. practicing, to be honest. Um, I, know, I know people who were in my year and below me who, who were practicing in their, yeah. in their deen and did, they did not change, mm. irrespective of what the medical students were doing. So, definitely. Yeah. So if anything, I probably became more practicing during med school. It was weird. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. You know, I, had, uh, I had some influences during med school who, yeah. you know, brothers who, you know, had positive influence on me Islamically, mm. um, which meant I was more practicing during med school. Um, and um, even though there was those things from med school who they tried to socialize or go do things mm. that are hard on, I said, no, thank you. And they respected that. Once they say, I can't do it because I'm not allowed in my religion, they say, okay. I think that they actually respect you more because you have values and principles. Yeah. 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 They'll, they'll respect you either yeah. way. Or well, they have to with all these new teachings, right? Yeah. All the diversity stuff. They've yeah. got to accept the Muslim now or else they're, you know, discriminating. Yeah. So, it actually that's works in our yeah. favor. And like what you were saying about like role models, and, and I think that's very important. Yeah. Because um, that was a concern of mine as well, personally. Like, I could see brothers that would go into med school and they'll change over time. Yeah. Not in a good way. No. Um, but if you have a, a, a good group of brothers yeah. with you, it makes a big difference. Like, you don't need. Like your the human need of socialization fulfilled through yes. these brothers or through through good people of instead course. of hang, having to hang out with no. non Muslims or go to like events that are haram. Yes, it's fulfilled through good company. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I had in 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 my when I was studying medicine, I had two or three brothers who were like really practicing who mm. I was close with during med school. Yeah, and I also had non Muslim friends who were not into those type of things as well, yeah, who yeah. stayed away from them. So yeah. we'll, we would hang around with each other, even during classes and, yeah. you know, and tutoring and in, in hospitals. Mm. But the thing you also got to remember is that even as a doctor, my, doc my friends are not just doctors. If anything, a very small subset of my friends are doctors. Mm. The vast majority of my friends are non-doctors yeah. and who are Muslims and practicing brothers. Mm. So you know, even if you can't fulfill your social or hanging out needs with the people at uni, exactly. you're always all outside yeah, of uni. Yeah, you know, hang out with your brothers, you know, go to the masjid, go to halakas, you wanna go fishing, you know, mm. the other stuff, you wanna go camping. Yeah. You know, you can get your um, get your social interactions elsewhere. from elsewhere. Yeah, you don't have to do it in med school. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Looking back on it, honestly, like did I miss out? Not really. I remember yeah. in our final year of med school they had like a like um do you know when you finish year twelve there's like a um what did formal or something like a formal, formal right? Yeah. We had one for medicine, yeah. right? And this formal was mixed. There was gonna be drinking, you know, dancing and music. Yeah. They said, "Oh, full can you coming?" I said, "No." Yeah. I said straight to the face. I said, "No, I'm not coming." Mm. And I said to my, I also told a friend of mine. I said, "Bro, 
X, Y, and Z, I don't think we should go. Mm. He agreed, and we didn't go. Mm. Do I regret it today? Not really. Yeah. Do I see those people? Not really. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. You just move on, man. You just stay strong and just move yeah. on. Especially if you set the the boundaries from from day one. Yeah. Like with me, they haven't asked me because they know. The yeah, people are coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think one guy asked me. Yeah, yeah. Because he doesn't know me that well. And he's just trying yeah. to be friendly. Yeah, yeah. And I said, no, I'm not going. That's yeah, it. Yeah. And it ended there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you just set this, if you yeah. set the standards from the start, you're just like this Muslim who doesn't do nothing. Yeah, that's <laughs> it, yeah. But you know, you know, whatever you do, even in med school, uh, even in the hospitals, whatever you do is being, mon what I say, monitored. People are watching. Yeah. What type of Muslim you are? How you interact with people? Mm. What are your principles? You know, you're always. Uh, being being watched mm. <laughs> per se but people yeah. are people are you are representing islam in the hospital yeah. both with other people other professionals as well as patients mm. and if you don't have if you don't have values and principles there's no difference between dr john smith and dr muhammad exactly. you're just a brown guy and he's a white guy exactly like that's literally it um but if you have principles that makes you different that exactly. makes you unique that makes you someone worth respecting. Exactly. Otherwise, you're like everyone else. Exactly. You know? And you know, as Muslims, we have our own ideals and our own principles, and we stick to them. Mm. And we don't, we don't, we don't bend down to people's whims and desires. Yeah. But um, as long as you explain to them the reasons why you want to do it, and you're friendly and courteous about it, yeah. people usually respect it. Yeah. yeah and even right. explain it to people who you would think are the widest of white people. Yeah. Explain to them nice and kindly, and they understand. Yeah. Right? I, I just remember the little story about handshakes. Before COVID. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, once, it was orthopedics actually, Campbelltown. Yeah, yeah. The registrar, she finished operating and I was helping her and she's like, high five. And I said, I don't, I did this. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't know you don't do high fives. <laughs> then I explained, it's like, it's like religious reasons. Yeah, then my friend, a Muslim friend, he was on orthopedics after me, next yeah, rotation. Yeah. And she didn't even high five me. She was like, oh, I know, you probably don't do high fives. So I'm not going to even <laughs> high five you. So like, they get it. And yeah, they're really respectful. She was really respectful about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Nah, um, so and carried on, the sunnah carried on. <laughs> <laughs> the mips started the tradition yeah. that that registrar would not be high-fiving Muslim, yeah. uh, Muslim uh, students anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, next question is, how can we benefit the Muslim community through medicine? That's a deep question, man. Mm. Um, look, I think, as I said to you before, I think medicine, uh, generally speaking, is one of those careers that you can work in that not you just you know earn a living, but you mm. can also help a lot of people. And I I believe um, well, my my th my my perspective is that you know the the there's a lot of Muslims who who are in medicine per se at the moment mm. um, who have, a lot of them have become GPs. No disrespect to people, yep. um, but they're only just going to work and coming back. Mm. And you ask them, you know, what are you doing further? You know, what khair work are you doing? What are you doing for fisa billah? Not much, mm. you know. You know, you, you you tell me, is there a Muslim organization in Sydney or in Australia of doctors who are going to Asian countries helping out people who are sick? Mm. No, it doesn't exist. Do you see Muslim doctors from Sydney who are going overseas as specialists to help, help out? I don't know any. I know one or two, but not much. Was relief or? Well, there's organizations, yeah. but those yeah. are organizations, oh, okay. right? But we're yeah. talking about professionals. I see, I see. Yeah. You know, yeah. people who are doing it themselves, you know. As I said, you know, there's, you know, though we can work here and become specialists, yeah, there's a lot of people out there, both in Muslim and non-Muslim countries, who actually need specialized health. Mm. And you know, one of those, one of those people who have uh, done an awesome job at this is Fred Hollows, right? Mm. He he did cataract eye surgery in poor countries for twenty-five dollars an operation. Mm. That's amazing, and it gives people vision again, mm. right? You know, where is this type of um, groundwork mm. from us? I think uh, in. Um from our uni, there's a pediatrician, um, white Australian Christian. Yeah. He goes every year to Bangladesh for 20 years. Really? Yeah. And takes students with him. Yeah. And he does, um, he just checks babies. Wow. Like every year he actually takes students from the uni. Yeah, yeah. Or um, training pediatricians. Yeah. For 20 years he's been going. So like if they can do it, and he's, this is a completely foreign country for him. Bangladesh, yeah. bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, then we can surely, inshallah, even if it's man. locally as well. So, like you mentioned, some overseas ideas. What about locally? What are some things Muslims, Muslim doctors can get involved with? Some ideas or, or visions to help the local you know, community. One, one of the things I realized, especially, especially during this COVID pandemic, is the distrust that the Muslim community has with science and medicine. Mm. And 
what I've, you know, what's a sad thing is that they don't trust or they have a, you know, a dis disconnect between the, the specialists or the people who are leading in the field and, you know, practically what's going to happen in medicine. You know, and I say this to people who I'm explaining about this situation. If I'm going to build a house, do you think as a doctor I'm going to build a house? No. Mm. It's out of my league, completely. Mm. You know, when it comes to health and well-being and how to manage diseases and pandemics, you look at the professionals. Now, I don't, th it's like, I don't see any leading figureheads in the Muslim community in science and research. Mm. In, back in the old days, what, six, seven hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, the Muslims were at the top end of science. Mm. We were actually leading science. While Europe was in the dark ages, the Muslims were ahead yeah. in medicine and science. Mm. It's like we're flipped now. Yeah. The Muslims are falling behind. Mm. And other people are taking charge. Yeah. Now, it should not be like that. You know, as Muslims who, who believe in the Quran and Sunnah, we look at our evidences in our deen and implement it according to what's present. And we should do the same thing when it comes to anything in life, whether mm. it be engineering, science, or law, right? Mm. Everything has to have a methodology. Mm. And we used to be the forefront of this or the pioneers in those fields. Mm. I think we can one day as well be pioneers in those fields again. Mm. So I think if we have Muslims, young Shabab coming through in the medical schools, um, I think they should be aspiring to hit very high levels mm. uh, in specialization or in uh, career development. So if they become the, the person in that field, yeah. that's awesome. Mm. Like if, uh, let's say, if Ahmed becomes the leading person in cardiology mm. or, you know, Fatima becomes the leading person in obstetrics. Yeah. That's being, you know, mm. a bit sexist there. But, yani, you know, I'm trying to say, yeah. you know, either or, mm. sister or brother who does it. Yeah. Yani, we don't have, you know, a, f a figurehead in, you know, a well-respected person in those fields. Yeah. Not yet. Mm. You know, so if we have more people coming in. Um, and then we can, you know, easily educate our community in regards to the processes in medicine and what, how things are done and try to explain things to them. Mm. So, yeah, it's a big struggle. <laughs> so you've, you've mentioned visions and ideas for within medicine itself. Yes. But um, usually medical students or doctors have, they're usually multi-skilled. Yes. Where could they use their skills? Or even as you mentioned in the beginning, that respect that they get. <laughs> um, whether it's uh, actually correct or not, that's mm. a different point. Yeah. Um, where could they use that to help the community? Uh, I haven't thought that far ahead, mm. to be honest, Labib. Mm. Um, you know, if you if you're you know, as I say, like you know, if you become a, a a a doctor in the community, you become a point of reference for a lot of people. A lot of you become well yeah. known. Yeah. So when it comes to, for example, organisations who are trying to plan things, you can also be a a when I say consultant, but you can provide ideas and perspectives mm. to those local communities or those local local initiatives yeah. uh, to help them in trying to do programs for mm. X, Y, and Z. So, for example, if MIA wanted to do something for the community and they wanted ideas from the ground, and they can speak to our, us, like doctors, yeah. and see what, you know, yeah. what we're generally uh, have the feel from yeah. the community to give them some insight of things they can focus on for dawah, for charity, mm. um, for, you know, communities, mm. activities, yeah. I think adding on to that, like, um, helping out financially, that's another, I'd say another oh, yes. big thing. Oh, yes, that's another big one, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And, like, even, there's a lot of fiqh that's related to medicine. Or yes. even public health. Yes. Um, like fiqh or fasting. Yes. Um, solar, like can I pray standing, sitting. Like yes. You'd be surprised at how much there's a link to medicine. Yeah. And even like general health, like yeah. diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and all that. Yes, and injections um, and whether yeah. they're halal and all yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. So like I think there's a lot to offer the community. Yeah. Just helping an everyday Muslim live their life. Yes. Like they might not need a knee, sur knee replacement surgery. Yeah, that's right. But highly likely that they need something to do with fasting yeah. or medications they take or something along or yeah. public health yeah. measures or something along those lines, yeah. So I guess when it comes to anything in regards to providing a, a fatwa for something, you need both the the, the textual evidence from yeah. Quran Sunnah and as well as uh, professional yeah. uh, yeah. advice. So you will need uh, advice from yeah. doctors to say, yeah. this is the situation and this is the yeah. understanding and present them to the mashaykh and the yeah. scholars in a way that they can understand. Yeah. And what That's better way to do it yeah. is because, you know, if, uh, for example, if a mashaykh or a scholar or imam wants to give a, a, a ruling on a specific vaccine, 
mm. and you're going to tell this uh, sheikh to read up the product information and understand the ingredients and how it's made, they're not going to understand. Yeah. So if you have medical professionals in the field to ex mm. explain to them what's in each and how it's made and the reasons why we do it, then they can have a more understanding on yeah. why we, or yeah. the first one that they're going to provide. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and they have to do it. They have to consult. They have to. The people of the field. Yeah. They have to. Yeah. And as much as I know my limits, yeah. like you asked me about medicine, I tell you I'm not sure, go mm. see someone else. The, everyone has to understand their limits of knowledge and yeah. know when to consult other people. Mm, I think that's a, a, an yeah. attribute we all need. Um, we're almost about to finish, inshallah. Inshallah. So just recapping and some final advice. So the first point, what are some traits the Shabab can work on having yeah. from right now if they want to get into medicine and excel in it? Mm. Like what, would say, what would you say are the key traits that they would need to embody from now? I think or try to embody from now, yeah. So first there is, you know, having a, have good, having a good relationship with Allah Azza wa um, And doing, you know, dua for a lot of the things that you're trying to endeavor. And having a good connection with Him and having your intentions clear. Mm. They're trying to have it for His sake, that's one. And the second thing that is quite important is to have a, be consistent. Um, you know, things will go up and down a little bit. But you always have to try be on the ball, you know, consistently so you can be, um, uh, achieve what you want to achieve. Because mm. if you like trying to do something and then you drop off and try again, you're not going to be able to achieve your final yeah. goal. If you want to achieve something that's a big achievement mm. or something that's a, a task, you need to have a consistent effort. You need to stay at it and continue working at it. Mm. Um, I think those are the two simp you know, general advice that I'll give. Yeah. Um, so just sincere intentions, having a good relationship with Allah Azza and being consistent. Because mm. um, you see a lot of people flipping their mind, changing their ideas. But you just want to make up your mind early and focus and go for it. Mm. Inshallah. Inshallah. Any final advice or words you'd like to share with the Shabam? Um, final advice? This is going to probably sound like opposite what I've been telling you, talking about the whole night. But look, at the end of the day, you want to do what you want to do. Mm. Um, medicine in itself as a specialty, or even as a career, is not easy. In any, like anything else in life. So you want to pick something that you're interested in mm. and you want to do because you're going to put a lot of time and effort into mm. it. And whatever you do choose, uh, just know that you're, whatever you do do, it's important that you perfect it. And let it be, you know, becoming an imam, uh, becoming a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, you know, a teacher. You know, we need the community. The ummah is like a machine and all the gears are moving. Mm. And if you want the whole machine to work properly, all the gears need to be perfect, mm. right? So if we want our community to go forward, if you want us to progress forward, mm. all of us have to pull our weight and be the best that we can be. Mm. So if we're entering medicine, we're going to be the best that we can be. If we're into other fields, we're going to be the best that, we, that mm. we can be. So whatever you do, it doesn't have to be medicine. I'm not trying to force it down your throat to be a doctor. Mm. But if you do choose it, awesome. Join the ride. It will help you out, inshallah. inshallah. All of us will, all yeah. the doctors we can. We hope you try to become the best doctor you can be. Mm. Um, but whatever you do in life, just um, make a lot of dua and work hard. Um, yeah, mm. that's what I can say. Jazakallah <laughs> khairun. That, that analogy at the end was, was really profound about the gears and. It is, man. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the reality of the situation. Like, you know, every person in our community is important in their own way. Mm. Some people can provide quite sophisticated, specialized knowledge, and some people provide the general, simple stuff, mm. right? Either way, though, if things want to work in in some in any situation, an organization, in a community, in a state, mm. everyone has to pull their weight. Yeah, everyone has to fulfill their roles. If we have Muslims across the whole board who are awesome at whatever they do, mm. that's awesome, man. Because then we can actually be profound and be respected and be provide back to our community mm. and you know provide back to where we live. Mm. So let's move on to Q&A until um, Maghrib. Sure. Adan. Um, so I've got some questions, questions here. <laughs> sure. um, so how did your opinion regarding your preferred specialty change before and after actually studying medicine? So you, you mentioned you, had, you were considering you know, emergency and med medicine. Yeah, so um, yeah. Before I started medicine or before I got into medical school, I was thinking more about cardiology. Mm. The heart specialty, where you learn mm. about the heart, how it works, yep. and any diseases with that. But, you know, over time, I just found it a little bit boring. <laughs> mm. You know, I just feel like if someone has heart disease or their heart attack, I just feel like you're tweaking their little things and, you know, try to do little things. And the person still has a problem, but you're just trying to help them with their mm. life. So there's not, there's not like great satisfaction in what you do. Mm. 
And then I thought about pediatrics, which is kids, mm. right? And I just, I wanted the pediatrics because kids are awesome, yeah. right? They're, they're, you know, sinless little, little beings, you know, just awesome to deal with. But, you know, then I thought, you know, there's only two main hospitals in Sydney that do pediatrics. Yeah. And it's hard to, you know, as a career later on to be in that field. Yeah. Um, and then I started growing more interest in uh, surgery yeah. uh, because I found that in surgery, it's one of those things that you can do something yeah. that you can do in front of you and you can see the benefits very soon after. Yeah. And out of all the specialties that are on offer, I found that um, orthopedics is one of the ones that is high satisfaction. So let me give you an example. You have an old grandma come into hospital, she broke her hip. And she Classic. can't walk haram. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Nof, a nickel femur fracture. Mm. She can't walk haram, she's in a lot of pain. And you say, look, don't worry, uh, Mrs. whatever, Mrs. X, we're going to get you into surgery. We're going to tell you how you're going to do it. And once you come out, the next day you're going to walk. Mm. She's like, next day? I said, yes, next day you're going to walk. Mm. And there's a lady who's in pain a lot in the, in mm. the bed because she broke her hip. So we take her to surgery and when she comes out of surgery and the next day you see her on the ward walking. Mm. And then you walk by and say, Mrs. X, how are you doing? How's everything going? She's like, oh, I'm feeling okay. Mm. I'm in a little pain, but thank you very much. Mm. So you know that the thing that you just did yesterday, the person was in bad pain, but now is able to walk and is thanking mm. you. So there's, a, there's quite a significant job satisfaction associated with that. So you feel mm. good and happy with what you're doing yeah. in your job. Mm. So um, I think that's the reason why I stuck with that. Emergency was one of the things I considered, but then I thought, um, it's, for me, emergency is just like a GP, but in a hospital. Yeah. It's like you see everything, yeah. and you got to just you know, send them off to specialties. So mm. um, that's why I, I couldn't do that. Mm. Yeah. So that's why. That's it. So that, my interest in orthopedics mainly started towards the end of med school and internship and residency. Mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> Next question is, uh, what is the most challenging aspect of being slash becoming a doctor? The time, to be honest. Time? Yeah, the, the, the amount of uh, effort you need to put in. Yeah. Like, um, if I, you know, like, for example, I'll give you an example in my case, doing the, the, the bachelor's degree of medical science and then doing the medical degree is seven years. Mm. Now doing the PhD is three more. So I've been to university for nearly 10 years now. Mm. And also becoming a surgeon itself, that's the practical learning is another eight to 10 years. So if you think about it, it mm. takes you roughly from when I finish high school to becoming a qualified surgeon for me, it's going to take me roughly around 20 years. Mm. That's a long time. Mm. <laughs> That's a really long time. And if you were to ask me when I was 18, would I do it now? I'd be like, uh, <laughs> I'll probably think about it twice. But I can tell you from now, well, I'm 31 now. And it feels like yesterday I graduated. Mm. How long has it been now? 13, 13 years. Yeah. It feels like yesterday I was finished high school. Mm. It feels like yesterday I finished med school. It feels like yesterday I started my PhD. Mm. Time flies. But then you look forward, you're like, I still have another eight to 10 years to go. But inshallah, that should fly too. Inshallah. And inshallah, after that, you know, things should calm down and you can appreciate life a bit, you know, mm -hmm. a bit more better. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Um, so, <laughs> someone asked, did you suss out your specialty through what you see yourself as? Like, what are other factors to figure it out? I know you mentioned the job satisfaction and the yeah. immediate impact. Yeah. Wait, are there any other factors that led you to orthopedics? Look, for me, one of the things that I wanted to do in, in, as I said, you know, as I said, when you want to do something in medicine, mm. you want to pick something that you're satisfied with, but you also what you think you can do benefit in. So I think that when it comes to a surgical specialty or any surgical mm. specialty, it's one of the things that you can uh, provide benefit or help a lot of people wherever you are. Mm. So I can take, for example, the specialty of orthopedics, what I learned in Australia. I can be able to practice it in the Philippines. Mm. I can practice it in China. I can practice it in Saudi Arabia. I can mm. practice it in America. Yeah. Wherever I am, I can help people. Mm. Because what my assets that I, I was able to learn is not what I earn in life, but mm. what my hands can do from the grace of Allah. Mm. You know, what we can do physically, what we can help people with. Mm. Right? So that's something that I found that in orthopedics, especially when it comes to um, our areas, you know, both locally and overseas, you know, when it comes to accidents or, or traumas, orthopedics has a mm. big important role in that. Yeah. So people breaking their bones, people getting affected by, uh, you know, explosions, mm. um, people um, in accidents and stabbings and bullet wounds, it's all orthopedics. Mm. Uh, so it's one of the specialties where you can actually, you know, though you can do joint replacement surgeries here, for example, mm. you can go overseas and, you know, deal with people with complicated fractures or infections mm. um, or work with people who had accidents, yeah. Mm.
So you, you, you can see a diverse range of patients. Very diverse. And using that skill set. Yeah, exactly. across the board. Exactly. Yeah. So one of my key interests is trauma, which is all those mm. accidents. Another subspecialty I'm interested in is pediatrics in, mm. in orthopedics. And you combine the two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you do. You're coming a specialist in orthopedics for kids. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you can go and help the people do operations in little kids who have problems with their hips, mm. with their legs, with their foot, with mm. their feet. So you know, you know, if a kid comes out and they have an issue with their hip, they need operation with. Mm. Well, like you do operation with them, and then after that, the hip is normal. So you you, ha you provided the opportunity with Allah's will mm. to allow that kid to be walking normal again for the rest of their life. Mm. Imagine I did in that. Yeah, yeah. Inshallah, we ask Allah to Inshallah. reward us. Mm. Like, you know, there's a lot of benefit you can provide mm. and people will be um, very pleased and very thankful for the, whatever offer you offer them. So mm. I feel like orthopedics is one of those things that you can help a lot of people with mm. and you get uh, quick results, mm. which is what I like. <laughs> um. <laughs> We've got a question here. How do you not get grossed out while wo whilst working? Oh man, I don't get grossed out. So I talk about this with my with my wife. Like when it comes to things, when it comes to like you know feces, and poo, and wee wee, I can't handle wee -wee. that. I just can't. This is one of the things I can't do. Mm. But you talk to me about blood, guts, or well, blood, bones, mm. um, and all this other stuff. I have no problem. Yeah. Like when we open up, a, when we do a knee joint replacement, right? We bring up the knee like this and we cut around it and we open up the entire knee joint. Yeah. And then we use bone saws and we literally cut the knees from two sides, mm -hmm. two sides. We take those bone parts out and then we put a metal and metal and a plastic mm -hmm. and we close the knee up again. Mm -hmm. That's awesome for me. Yeah. But people say if I saw that, they'll fall over and collapse. I think, I think it's, you get used to it. Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. But even the first time I went into operations in medical school, I saw yeah. that, I was like, that's awesome. Oh. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't know about you, but for me, it was awesome. Um, um, one of the, the most interesting things I saw in med school is we were, we were doing an operation in um, someone's neck that had a cancer. And the person, the surgeons, they cut all here and lifted the entire thing up. Mm. I saw everything inside. Mm. It was absolutely amazing mm. the way that Allah Zawajal created us. Mm. It's amazing, the anatomy that you saw. So, um, but yeah, so it's cool. As I say, when it comes to like poo-poo and wee-wee stuff, I can't handle it. Good in the colorectal. No, yeah. <laughs> thank God I did it. <laughs> I, I can't do it. Um, but, but, when it yeah. but when it came to like uh, bones, uh, blood, uh, muscle, tissues, that's fine. I can handle yeah. it. But I do think it's it's a matter of getting used to like, yeah, like no. You reach a point, you're just like, it's normal. It's like every yeah, life. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. Like I remember when I used to first see the blood in the joints, I'd be like, oh, you know, got to yeah. make sure, you know, got to be careful. Yeah, but, don't get, like, yeah. but now we wear the orthopedic uh, space suits. Oh, we yeah, put them on yeah. and, you know, we're cutting the knees and all that. There's blood squirting on my face. But there's got a shield on. Yeah. So I'm wearing like a big alien. Yeah. yeah. And it's got, like blood hitting my face. So it's all on my hands. Like, yeah, whatever. Because yeah. at the end of it, you go <laughs> shunk and take everything off and nothing hit you. Yeah. There's like a barrier. Mm. But um, no, it doesn't turn you off. For mm. me, it doesn't. For some people, it will. Some people see a little bit of blood in their face. For me, I can see liters of blood, I'll be fine. Yeah. So, it just depends on people. <laughs> I think, yeah, like... Yeah, if you're going to faint with a little bit of blood, maybe medicine's not yeah, for yeah. you. <laughs> maybe you go do dermatology or something. Yeah. <laughs> something like even skin. just getting through, like, as a student, like, you're going to have to see surgery, surgeries that yeah, have a lot of blood. Yeah, surgical rotation, yeah. that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, but even as an intern, you've got to collect blood from your patients, right? Yeah. yeah so, so you've got to put a needle in and yeah. collect... So, like, yeah, and you're doing candles and all Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. So it's part of the job, I guess. Um, do you remember your patients? My patients? Look, I've seen a lot of patients in my time. I don't remember every one of them, but there'll be like a few that you remember. Yeah. Ones that you, they were quite distinct. Some that were traumatic, some that were pleasant. Mm. When I say traumatic, something bad happened to the patient and you remember it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you do remember some of them. Mm. Um, and even as a, as a doctor, and you, you probably don't really appreciate this, but you become like the um, de facto um, health professional for your family mm. and for your friends. So I get text messages from my friends, hey bro, I've got this problem, what do you think? Mm. Or they give me a call, hey bro, I've got this problem, what do you think? Mm. You know? um, so people, a lot of people talk to you and ask for advice very privately mm. that people would normally do to other people. <coughs> so mm. you become like a, a vault of secrets for a lot of people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, the people will be interested to know, but you have to hold it because mm. it's confidential. Yeah. yeah. Um, is the mother of time asked? I got 10 minutes, I think. Huh? Keep going. A few more questions. Okay. And we'll stop for a moment. Okay. Um, how did you manage everything else in life during med school? Basically, this person's asking, how do you manage your time? So you mentioned you're married. And I know you have a kid. 
Yeah. So like, the, yeah, from the left. Um, so. so I got married after med school. Yep. Um, in med school, I was single and I was in uni full time. So mm. I didn't have a side job. I was just focusing on uni. Mm. Um, and after, um, when it came to internship residency, I got, eventually got married, alhamdulillah, and then I had a child. She's just now 15 months. Mm. Uh, so you learn how, you've got to learn how to balance uh, life with um, profession. Yeah. So um, by doing medical school itself, I was just focusing on medical mm. school, which was, a, which was a good thing, I think. Mm. But um, yeah. Did you do anything else other than, so were you involved in a, in a masjid or in a da'a organization, uh, seeking knowledge, anything else? So I think during medical school, there was a time where I was involved in a bit with street da'a. Mm. And that was awesome because there was a lot of brothers who were involved and we used to do like uh, World Dawa Day or with the mm. brothers who used to go to the city. Um, so we used to be involved with that. Yeah. Um, also during medical school, um, I was involved with extracurricular activities which involved um, hunting. Mm. So I was in that, especially towards the end. Mm. Uh, so those are things I was doing other than med school to yeah. give some time off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also would play a lot of my PS4. Mm. So, you know, <laughs> going to take time off from being a doctor, yeah. play a bit of COD or, you know, call it a battlefield. Mm. Um, so I used to play a bit of that. But yeah, so you just got, you got to have a life uh, outside of medicine or things yeah. won't work. Mm. You're a human. Yeah. You have your needs and wants. Yeah. So we're just human like everyone else. So yeah. we're not robots. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, so someone asked a question, can you really work a few months out of a year as a specialist and then not work for the rest of the year? Like, would that suffice to make a living? So they give the example, of maybe you've heard Dr. Taufik Chowdhury. Yep. Um, I think it's in trauma, I'm not sure. I think it's in ED. ED, okay. Yeah. So from what I understood is that he works like three months a year, or yep. something like that. Yeah. And then nine months he does his like, charity work that or whatever. Yeah. So the is, case that, is that realistic? Yeah. Look, at the end of the day, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Right, but once you so what doctor uh, to my understanding, doctor, what doctor Tofik Chadri does is I mm. think called locuming. So he would locum for three months. He would yeah. go and work in hospitals that need help for three months, and the rest of the year he will go do dawa. Yeah. So you can do that if you want to. Mm. Um, it's called being a locum, or med locum medical officer, um, and you can do that more this, or less I after think your this residency. Just to clarify for the audience, like locum is like really short contracts of work. So a locum, for yeah. example, let's say. Let's give an example, Liverpool Hospital. Liverpool Hospital said, look, one of our doctors is sick. We need someone to come in urgently. We have no one. Mm. And then they speak to an organization that have locums and they can say, no problem. We have Dr. Furkan to come in and help you out. Yeah. And I'll go in, work that one shift and get out. Yeah. So then I normally people got a one year contract or a two year contract. You have no contract. You're a casual for many hospitals. Yeah. So they call you on short notice. So I think mm. Dr. Tafik Chadri works like that for a few NHS Month, public yeah. hospitals maybe yeah. um, and then he works the nine months as a, whatever he wants to do as a, yeah. as a dharma work. Can you do that? It's up to you if you want to. Would, you, would it suffice to make a living? No. <laughs> it would be, be challenging because if you're working as a locum for three months a year you have to work really hard for three months. Yeah, like a like lot nearly of hours, every day. Pretty nearly much. every day yeah. and then earn a quite a good in coin and then take the time off which you can. No, I, think, I think if, like, if you work 90, 90 locum shifts. Yeah, you probably can. You probably yeah, can. Look, you, you can. You yeah, probably can. You'll be fine, I reckon. You can. So if, if you yeah. earn like in that, in that three months, if you try to earn, you know, 70, 80K and take time off, then you're done. Yeah. And if you're happy with $80,000 yeah. a year, then you go for it. Yeah, but I think Dr. Tofik also has businesses on the side as well. Probably. Yeah. It's probably has investments and yeah. shares and, yeah. you know, yeah, so other so sources of income. income. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not a very black and white. You've got to adjust accordingly. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite part about your job after you finished school? I think I meant med school. Med school? Yeah. Favorite part? Yeah, I think the fact that you, whatever you do, um, you know that you are helping people. Mm. I think you, you know you can go to work and say, I help this person better in their life, especially in orthopedics. Uh, let it be with surgeries mm. or otherwise. You know, someone comes in, they have a problem and you help them. Mm. So I think that, that job satisfaction that you have of helping people that you see results quite quickly is actually probably the most rewarding thing that so lets you keep going. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing. Mm. Yeah, I, that's quite brief to the point. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's impactful, like even though it's brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's more or less. Yeah. That's that's the thing that pushes you. The thing that you enjoy the most. Mm. Yeah, because you can earn money from any job. 
yeah. anything you work in life will give you money mm. but um the fact that you know you're going to work and the fact that whatever you do for that eight or ten hours you're actually making change in people's lives mm. i think is the one thing that actually makes you satisfied mm. you say you know i know today i helped x y and z yeah or that person or this person benefited from what i did mm. I'm I'm done. Done. Yeah. Can you stop? yeah continue oh, okay no um <laughs> How w would it be becoming a surgeon but being homeschooled? I think they're saying, what's the pathway if you were homeschooled to beginning into medicine? Because surgery is like after medicine, or getting like, the medical degree. Yeah, degrees. so going to, so becoming a doctor via being homeschooled yeah, is yeah. something that you'll probably need to speak to homeschooling people about because I'm yeah. not too sure. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you need to more or less obtain an ATA. Or finish a degree. Or we'll finish a degree, yeah. So yeah. either go to university yeah. and do GAMSAT and do postgraduate medicine. Or if you're doing undergraduate, like finishing HSC, yeah. getting an ATAR, doing the UCAT, yeah. then you go for the interview. Yeah. So I don't think it necessarily is different for someone who's homeschooled. Mm. You just got to tick off those three boxes. Yeah. And once you've done that, you should be able to get in. Yeah. Um, whether or not you can get an ATAR that's high enough is a different mm. question. Yeah. So we'll see. There's a next question is... Okay, we'll stop here um, and we'll continue after Salah and Shalom. Sure. A few more questions. Yeah, no problem. All right, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Just a few more questions and we'll, we'll wrap up inshallah. So Before we go to them, do yeah. they have any questions? Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to them. Okay. We'll do that now. Last? <laughs> we'll do that now? Yeah, why not? They've been asking uh, anonymously. Okay, we'll get back yeah. to them. Like, these guys have been here sitting down, you know. Yeah. I uh, think about the crew in front of me. It's up to you, but we'll, 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 we'll go through these. Because sure. yeah, okay. these are almost done, inshallah. Um, so the question is, I'm worried I won't have... Uh, such friends, I think they said, they mean good friends at uni. What could I do? Uh, you find your friends outside of uni, simple as that, to be honest. Mm. Um, you find, have good networks of friends outside of uni. You can be friends that are after high school or the friends that you find outside through the musallas or through yeah. the masjids, right? Yeah. There's a lot of brothers that I met through the masjids, including yourself, for example. Mm. I met your brothers through here. Um, but you also have friends that you know through high school, for example. I still see with some of my friends I still saw since year seven. Mm. So these are friends I've known for at least 19 years and I still see them to today. Mm. And did I, keep, I kept seeing them during uni, I kept, still kept seeing them during medical school mm. and I still see them today. So if you have a good f group of friends who are not even in uni, it doesn't matter because you always, when you come, come back home, mm. you've got friends to hang out with. So mm. it's important to have a good unit of friends. Mm. Um, okay, so regarding Islamic contribution, so let's say hypothetically a Muslim achieves the top med level. What happens next? Why would, why would that help considering we're a marginalized minority? Are you talking from a medical or from a surgical point of view? I guess you could answer in both. Yeah, look, I guess even if we're Sorry, mind sorry, if I want to cut you off. Dahseen, can you sit at the front, please? Yeah, go on. So I guess from a surgical point of view, even if we're marginalized, it actually means that we actually have to even work harder, mm. right? Um, just like any other immigrant communities that came to Australia or to any other communities around the Western world, those communities had the first struggle initially and after that became quite established. Mm. For example, if you look at the Muslims in the United Kingdom or even in London, they were quite established and quite yeah. well um, placed within the wider community. So even if we are marginalized, I think we can still have a role in guys are trying to achieve what we can. Um, and if you become a leading figure in medicine or in surgery, either way, um, you become the, um, the respected opinion or, uh, or sought opinion when it comes to medical issues. So once you have people, can people or, um, or academics or colleagues who are in those fields, you actually we become more part of being integrated within the white community, wider community. I'm not saying we have to assimilate and lose our foundations, mm. um, but we just we can show that we can both live here and achieve and contribute, but yet hold our values. Mm. You understand? Yeah. So, um, we if we have this mindset of being marginalised and do nothing about it, we'll stay marginalised, mm. right? If we if we know we're marginalised, we have to try to work to actually achieve high, so we become recognized mm. and respected and integrated in the community mm. so we can you know work cohesively as yeah. a, a whole community yeah. and i think that's a that's been an issue in the past where maybe our parents generation would think that at some point they're going to go back home yes um 
but then our generation we don't think like that. No, nah, we're here. Yeah, <laughs> and, we're staying. Yeah, yeah. we're staying. So you know. it's either you learn to to accept it and you work with what you have. Yes. Or you can keep thinking in the dream of I'm going to go back to my village back yeah, home. Yeah, you know, having all those yeah. um, idealistic dreams that you know, probably won't yeah. be able to achieve. Yeah. Um, and people, most people might turn around and say your ideas and dreams are just idealistic and you won't be able to achieve. Yeah. But you know, there is a path to achieve it. There is a, something mm. you need to aim for and work hard for. But yeah, and if we just have this perception of we are the victim and we can't yeah. do anything or we're on the back foot, then we're not going to achieve anything. Mm. If you're already starting off your journey defeated, you're already finished. Mm. Um, you have to go in guns blazing as I say yeah. just go in hard and go in mm. strong yeah. um, how would one address the challenge of raising a child while going through their medical journey I don't know because I don't have one <laughs> but uh, not, not, oh not you mean med school, school or after not the journey in total uh, look it's it's look I guess it's, it's different when it comes to giving advice for a sister or a brother I think for a brother um, for as being a father for your child you need to balance and prioritize your life accordingly yep. so you would work and then you'll have a finite amount of time we have off you need to prioritize your family and your kids mm. higher than other things like your friends or your own so mm. your so social gatherings um, so you need to balance out see what your priorities are with your family your close family your friends will come first and then everyone else will come second or third mm. and when you have your free time you try to invest in that time in them it's not about the quantity of time it's about the quality of time you give them mm. so you would rather give your child good memorable moments that you were there and strong than always be present and you had bad memories mm. you know what i mean so it's all about the quality interactions that you have i'm not saying i'm a perfect person but I think that's that's the more important thing. Trying to have the quality time with them that will have lasting impressions on your children. Mm. Um, when your children can look up and say, Baba did X, Baba did Y. Baba's in the hospital helping people. That's why he's not here. Mm. You, your, your child can look and say, look, I know why my dad's not here or my mom's not here. was actually helping people. But, you know, when you do have time, you've got to spend time with them. Mm. So you don't want to destroy the child completely. Yeah. The next question is a bit of a personal one, so oh, up great. to you if, you if you don't want to answer it. Yeah, great. Um, someone's asking, what was your ATAR? <laughs> oh, it wasn't great. Well, I say it's not great because to get into medicine, you need to get 98, 99. My ATAR or my UAI was 94.8, mm. which is not great. Look, for, look, when it comes to getting into other degrees in university, 94.8 is awesome. You can get into whatever you want to get into. But for medicine, it's not good, mm. right? For medicine, you need to get 98, 99, 99.95. Well, you know, it's really high mm. marks, right? Now, hence, that's why I went through medical science into medicine. So it's a secondary route through UNSW. It's like a postgraduate degree. I did really well at university. Then I did the uh, UMAT again, got a good UMAT. I did UMAT three times. Mm. People usually do it once, I did it three times. And each time I did it, got better and better. Alhamdulillah. Um, so, so my marks in U high school were good, but not good enough. So hence, I went through the second route. And um, got in, Hamza. Hamza. So um, it's just got to be, as I said, it's all about persistence and being consistent. Mm. Um, just got to keep that momentum going or else um, you fall back. Mm. Um, so uh, the question is asking, hearing you say that you, you will have to work 20 years to become, I think they're saying an expert, which means like consultant of yes. specialist level, until you truly help the Ummah. <laughs> yeah. um, how do I know that at this age I can do it? You don't. Yeah. We, I didn't know either. Mm. Looking back when I was 18, did I know I was going to do it? No, I didn't. Do I still know I'm going to be able to do it? I still don't know. Mm. And that's the reality of your life. Yeah. I have a house today, but tomorrow I may be bankrupt. Mm. It's, it's anything's possible. Mm. But you know, at the end of the day, you can say, put your hand on your heart and say, I've tried my best. I had an objective and I worked hard for it. Mm. And if Allah wills it, then it'll happen. As long as I put my effort in. Mm. So if I do it and I get to it, then awesome. If I tried and it didn't work, and we ask Allah Azawajal to reward us, but maybe it was not good for me to and do it. And something better was... Something better yeah. will happen, yeah. something more khair. But the key is you got to put the effort in. Of I think course. people like to of course. make it, um, like look for excuses or reasons. Yeah. Say, oh, so this yeah. person who's asking the question, I'm not yeah. trying to degrade them whatsoever. They think the only time I can benefit is after the 20 years. Mm. But as I said to them, as, as I was trying to say, even when I work in the hospital on the ward, mm. even simply as writing antibiotics for someone or putting in a cannula for them or trying to give them new medications, it's helping them. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is at the end of the 20 years, 
you become a very good asset mm. in the sense that you have skills that not much people can do you know like for example you look at a com wider community in the Mu let's say the muslim community in sydney how many of them do you know are muslims who can operate on people's hips and knees mm. you count with your fingers mm. so if there's if you become one of those 10 or 15 people out of 50 or 60,000 you become an asset yep right but if you're trying to say it's going to take us 20 years, um, it's such a long road, you know, you have to wait 20 years to become beneficial, yeah. then are you trying to say we shouldn't do it at all? Because mm. if we have that mindset, well, it's going to take too long, it's, you're not going to do it, then we're never going to achieve it. Mm. And if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Mm. I think uh, one, one sheikh, he puts it nicely, he says, so there's, there's uh, building yourself and yes. giving. Yes. And as you progress, you're... You start with a lot of building, you build yourself, yes. and the giving will be less. But yes. as you progress, yes. the scale will tip. Exactly. And when you're at the end, you won't be studying as much. You may you be keeping up to date with the latest research. Yes, research and procedures, and, and, yeah. yes, correct. But your, your atha, your giving, will be very high. Exactly. Yeah. Because you'll be training the new registrars. Of course. And, of course. Yeah. and even, for example, even on the training program, we're yeah. still doing operations in hospitals. We're mm. still helping people. Yeah. Even though what your, 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 inf your reach or your influence of reach is only mm. small within the hospital, mm you're not as influential in the wider community and even yeah. in the national or international stage um, but you're still helping people irrespective mm. even in the most junior doctor as an intern you're helping people mm. yeah and you, so yeah the question i disagree with because mm. you don't have to wait for 20 years to become beneficial for people yeah. even as a local medical officer even as a gp become beneficial yeah. Yeah. but you know just this career path as a becoming a surgeon is longer but the, the impacts or the effects you can have, it will be more profound mm. later down the track. Mm. There's a r just sowing the seeds now for later fruits. Yeah, definitely. Um, last question from the ones that were sent. Um, is it ideal to have a job while doing med school? Uh, depends on you, to be honest. Mm. If you can balance the two, go for it. Uh, I wasn't one that can balance, so I was only just doing medical school. But I know a brother that you and I both know who runs a business during mm. med school. Um, I know another brother who would do it, the brothers who were doing tutoring during yeah, med school. Heaps. Yeah. Heaps of brothers. I know mm. another brothers who were working side jobs during medical mm. school. Uh, so it depends on the person. You know, I wasn't very uh, financially inclined during medical school. I was happy to live a student mm. life in a tight budget, you know. So I just kept focus on mm. my, my medical degree and, and my Xbox. Yeah, it depends on circumstances as well. Exactly. If you have a family, it's different. Exactly. If you, if you yeah. have a child and you're in medical school, then yeah. you need to work, you've got no choice. Yeah, yeah. But if you're single like me, you're just mm. in medical school, you don't have much financial pressures mm. then. And it also depends on how many hours of work. Like Correct. Job is a very vague term. Yeah, job can be anything yeah. from two hours to 40 like hours. hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it yeah. depends. So if you yeah. only do like, hypothetically, like tutoring like eight hours a week, yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely doable. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's easy, feasible. Easy, it's possible to do. Yeah. So that's um, still work, yeah. One more question. Oh. Uh, so what things can you do at, at med school to increase your chances into ortho specialty? Uh, it depends who this person is who This, person this person's is in med school. This yeah. person is in med school? Yeah. Okay. Um, you need to start networking with your local orthopedic team in the hospital. Mm. Uh, trying to attend to their meetings, trying to show some research initiative, trying to attend their clinics or operations. It's all, all about getting yourself known. Mm. And it's all about building a name for yourself within the surgical field. But you need to have that as a rotation, assuming like. Yeah, usually. Yeah. It's good to have a rotation first yeah. so they get familiar with you. Yeah. So then if you rotate to other specialties, you can always say, oh, can I come back and do stuff? Then they'll mm. be fine for you to come back and mm. visit and do some things. Um, I think doing for medical school things like research early is a good idea. Mm. Um, then you can just get that out of the way. Mm. So yeah, becoming familiar with your hospital's surgical team is a good step forward. Mm. And then interacting with them and being in their presence and learning from them is good mm. to help your chance of be doing orthopedics in the long run. Mm. Yeah, All right. so. sounds good. Um, so any questions from the audience? Mohammed? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, so, in med school, I'll have like a student allowance coming from Centrelink as youth allowance. Youth allowance, student yeah, allowance is one of them. Yeah. Uh, so, I didn't have a car. Um, I would go everywhere on public transport. Um, so, uh, what I'll do is like, for example, I'll um, go everywhere with public transport using my Opal card. 
Um, if I need to go anywhere far, I'll go with friends and they'll take me with them. And we'll eat simple things and we don't go with any extravagant food. Um, so you can live on that type of budget when you're a student, you don't have rent, you don't have bills. So you can live, it's fine. Um, it depends on your taste. If you have a simple taste, you're fine. If you'd like to live an extravagant life, then <laughs> you need to work. <laughs> any other yeah. questions? Awesome. Yeah, uh, it's a good so question because I crack mine too, to be honest. Uh, I think the only, the only thing you should be aware of is when you're cracking your neck, uh, because there's a risk when you crack your neck, you can actually affect the arteries in your neck. It's called a vertebral artery, and you can have a stroke. Um, Say again. You shouldn't crack your neck at all. But your knuckles and all that is nothing. It's just I crack mine as well. But just be careful of your neck, because I said you've got two arteries. You've got two arteries at the front, two arteries at the back. And if you crack too much, you get a thing called a dissection of the vertebral artery, which is a, the blood vessel inside your neck and starts ripping. And it cuts off the blood supply to your brain, you can get a stroke. So, yeah, no good idea. Yeah? Any, uh, any, uh, any specific way of how you crack your neck? Or is, is there a specific way or generally any? <laughs> did you hear what he said? <laughs> and did you hear what he said? I said just don't do it. Consult. That's that's don't six crack. dollars. Don't crack. <laughs> don't crack. Uh, what yeah. Is there a question or? You have a question? Shabab, shabab. The final exams for medicine. Yeah. In the degree. The in in the side the degree. What's the pass fail rate? Like in the which year of the degree? At the end of the degree? Yeah. Oh, nearly everyone passes, bro. Yeah, the end of the year. It's like ninety-five percent of the students pass. A very small amount of people fail. No, sorry. Uh, like, I mean, like, what's the what's the line where you pass or you fail? Fifty percent. Yeah, you've got to pass fifty percent. You know, in university here, here a thing called peers get degrees. Even in medicine, it's got to pass. So but but getting it. 50 is much harder in medicine. Yes, getting a 50 in medicine is still it's a good achievement. <laughs> Trust me, because the information is like this much. So if you if you just get enough to pass, it's, you're still you're doing fine. If you fail, that means you need help. Yeah. How much did you get? In med. Yeah. Uh, this guy's a very personal question. It's very personal. Be my academic transcript. Um, <laughs> Let's give it to him next time. I think in my multiple choice, I got like 54 percent. And my. In my interviews, I think I got an interview, the, the doctors, senior doctors sit down with you and they ask you what you learned from medical school, what do you want to do as a doctor. It's like having another interview but at the end of your degree. Um, I think in that I got like 80 something. I think they really liked the way I talked to them and the way I thought. And I think uh, the, the CEX, I can't remember that one, probably in the 60s or 70s. Yeah. As I said, please get degrees, man. Yeah, I was surprised with the, with the portfolio exam, which is the interview exam. Mm. I was very surprised at my call, that's great. There's <laughs> a question? No. Uh, when you are starting to become a GP, what areas do you focus in? Um, I think it's a bit of a vague question. If you want to be a GP? Yeah, so uh, to do a GP, you do internship residency first in the hospitals. So you, you do different rotations in medicine, surgery, emergency department, and relief. Um, and then when you want to be a GP, you do um, you actually do two years or three years uh, in actual community in uh, GP centres. So you become working with other GPs. You become the registrar, which means you're a training doctor, and you're actually just more or less seeing patients as a normal GP sees. If you have any questions, you ask the, the normal GP if there's any help you need. Um, but you need to see anything from, WB help me out here, we'll do mm. GPC in their practices. Anything from... Everything. Everything. Yeah. My eye hurts, my jaw hurts, my neck hurts, everything. My stomach hurts. Anything you think of that you see your GP for, you'll have to see. Nothing. So you see for any specialty, from eyes, mouth, chest, tummy, legs, mm. neck spine yeah it's very very broad you see everything yeah any other questions uh, what kind of things did they look for in the initial interview to get into degree and then the interviews are more often it's a good question you mean is this again to med school yeah again to med school. 
Um, I can only talk for UNSW Medicine, uh, which is that's the one I went to. Um, they wanted to, they really wanted to know what type of person you were, um, and whether you're mentally ready for the journey of being a doctor. Um, your interactions, what you think about medicine, what are your hopes, what will you do if you don't get into medicine. So they want to know how uh, mentally mature you are, or how how on board, or how 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 much you appreciate what's happening around you. Um, I think other universities are different. I think UW, UWSU is what? Mini stations? Yeah, so it's like, um, it's very different to UNSW. Yeah. So you can answer that one. Uh, I think now it's four stations, not eight. Okay. It used to be eight when I did it. And you get random things, like, it's more about assessing your broader skills, like how you work in a team, what you do to manage stress, uh, how do you lead, there'll be some ethical scenarios, perhaps, how you react to situations. Um, there, there was no question about why do you want to study medicine. Because we had that. Yeah, 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 but you guys are more panel. Yeah, yeah, panel, um, two people. So, yeah, it's... But so, don't worry, once you reach that stage, inshallah, give us a call. Yeah, yeah. Message. So if you ever reach that stage and you're, you've got good ATAR, you've got a good UCAT score, and you're actually getting a good chance against the med, you can reach out to someone like Labib or myself or some other brothers, and there's always people who can help you out in that stage and trying to mm. understand where you're going to go into and get ready for that. Um, the key is to get to that stage, so getting good UMAT, or um, good ATAR and good UCAT, which is a challenge in itself, yeah. Um, next question, sorry, there are two more. Sure, go for it. How do you get, how do you get into research if you don't know much about it? Um, well, it depends who this person is asking. Are they in med school? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you want to get involved with people who are actually already doing research. Mm. Um, and this can be people with backgrounds and masters of research or PhDs. Mm. And if they're already in clinical research and you say you're interested, they'll be happy to teach you the techniques. Mm. But also in medicine, they also teach you how to different research techniques and methodologies. Yeah. So you'll learn from there as well. Um, but there's also there'll also be some courses or things you can go to. They'll teach you different uh, research. Methods. I think it's not projects, but uh, like if it's an MD course, there'll be a research project. Yes, that's right. So it's just a matter of finding perhaps like an ortho. Yes, yeah, so if you if you're interested in orthopedics and you want to do research, then you've got to yeah. find people who are in orthopedics who are doing research, yeah. to you know approach them, introduce yourself, and mm. say you're interested. Mm. And if you're hardworking and you're consistent, then they'll take you up on board and do research with you. Yeah. 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 Um, do uni marks matter even for a specialty like author? No. You mean medicine marks? In yeah, uni? yeah. No. Mm. What matters for author is um, amount of time you spent as an unaccredited reg, um, how much publications you have, how much if you got a master's or a PhD degree, um, if you presented at conferences, yep. and if you finished specific um, co courses like uh, EMST. CRISP. These are s surgical courses. Okay. So if you finish, these are, it's all part of the CV. They count. So you they don't look at your university mark anymore. So it's like whoosh, in the bin. Mm. As long as you got your MD, that's all they may care about. Mm. Yeah. Any other questions, Shabab? Yeah, go for it. When you're uh, a GP, a So if you work as a GP in the city, like Liverpool, Auburn, Bankstown, you're in an office all the, most of the time, usually all the time, mm. unless you do community calls or go to nursing homes to help old people. Um, if you work in a rural town, like in country town, like Orange, um, Bathurst, not Bathurst, Orange, Blaney, all those small little ho in the west, then sometimes the GPs actually work with hospitals. So they actually go into hospital and work there. So um, this depends. The rural GPs work differently to the city GPs. Um, if you're a city GP, you're mainly in your office, in your clinic. Uh, if you're in the rural, you probably mix it up with clinic and hospital. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Um, before we conclude, inshallah, I just wanted to thank Dr. Furqan for That's giving right, us his man. time and for giving us an insight into medicine as a career and answering our questions. Um, just to conclude, um, at MIA, we have a Young Adult Islamic College, um, which is going to start very soon. So it goes by the school terms, and they cover the Islamic sciences over three years. So many of you are actually students there, um, but for those who aren't aware about it, we cover Aqidah, Fiqh, Sirah, Hadith, Tazki, and Manners, and Tafsir. Um, registrations are open now. 
And we have our open day or enrollment day this Saturday at MIA from 10 a.m. So if you want to enroll, register on the website and just rock up this Saturday at 10 a.m. And you'll find us here upstairs, inshallah, taking, on, taking in enrollments. Um, if you have any questions about it, you can ask me after. Um, but this is a very beneficial program. And it's tailored for your age group, um, you know, 12 plus, 13 plus, so high school students. And it's for brothers and sisters. So the sisters have separate classes with female teachers. Um, and the brothers have male teachers, separate classes. So it's a really good program, um, inshallah. And so if you're interested, you can visit the website and register. We can have a chat to my soul for brother Asif here. And we can give you more information. Um, we'll conclude with that. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruk wa atubu alaykum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.